Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. Um, please stand with me if you're able um, and turn to number 10 in your hymn, hymnal worship book. Here in this place, number 10. Verses 1, 2, and 4. Good morning and welcome to Harrisonburg Mennonite Church. We are glad that you are here this morning, whether you are physically present here in our worship center or if you are watching via our stream, welcome. We're glad that you're part of our worship this morning because here at Harrisonburg Mennonite Church, we believe that God has called us to be a community of faith that is engaging with God in worship, with each other in fellowship, and with our neighbors in friendship. If you uh, look at your bulletin this morning, we do have, for particularly our visitors, we have a little tear off that's on that back part of the bulletin. Uh, we'd love to know who you are. Uh, we promise not to abuse any of that contact information. We do not sell it to any marketers, just so you know that. We don't do that. This has no cookies in it. Now, if you want a treat, you can meet me back in the, uh, in, in the east foyer out here, this is for our visitors, we do have a welcome bag for you that actually does have some treats. No cookies, but it does have a treat in there. So we'd love to uh, get a chance to meet you and welcome you to Harrisonburg Mennonite Church and let you know a bit about who we are and what we do here. The other announcements are in your bulletin. There's one that I do want to draw to your attention, which was actually in the weekly email announcement, and that has to do with, uh, with MCC kits that are women's, oh gosh, I'm going to blow this. It's the women's sewing group. I know they have another name. Service and something. Service and fellowship? What's that? Friendship? They're friends? Well, that's good. Anyway, they are gathering um, Mennonite Central Committee health kits. These are to go to areas of the world which we know there are numerous, where people are simply deprived of the very basics of life. And uh, there's at each of our entrances, exits, there are uh, some bags that you can pick up, and there's a list of what needs to go in that, and you can fill it. Or if you want to pick up the, the, just the list and bring the materials back, and somebody else will fill the bag, that's also fine. Um, if you forget to do that, look at your weekly email announcement. There's a link that you can click on that'll take you right to the list as to what's needed in these 
health kits. This morning, we are one week past our celebration of the resurrection of Easter Sunday. At the end of Matthew's gospel, following the resurrection, as I should say following, yes, it's that morning of the resurrection, that uh, those that came to the tomb are told by the angel in Matthew's gospel to sitting on the stone say, he's not here, he's risen. Go ahead into Galilee or go to Galilee. There you will see him for he's going there ahead of you. Galilee. Why go to Galilee? Hmm. Well, Jake's sermon is nothing about that this morning, just so you know. But I wonder, what was the conversation along the road? I mean, they didn't you know, get in a plane and fly to Galilee. They didn't do that. They didn't all jump into a, you know, a nice church van like we have and drive there. They walked. That's a long walk. What did they talk about? Maybe, just maybe, what they talked about was all the things that happened in Galilee, wondering, why are we going back to Galilee? What does Jesus want us to do, to remember, to experience in Galilee? And certainly one of the things they had to talk about was, do you remember when we all gathered on that hillside? And Jesus had this enormous crowd there on that hillside, that grassy hillside that just went right down into the water. And he began to teach. Do you remember what he said? That's what we're going to be looking at. Part of that, the Sermon on the Mount. What is it that's so different about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of this world? I have another announcement for you this morning. Actually, I'm not going to make it. Deb Pardini is going to be making the next announcement. It has to do with women's tea. Good morning. As was already mentioned, that community is something that we value and we work at all the time. So some of us got together and said, what can we do to foster another community event or to foster relationships, especially among women? Sorry, guys. So we decided on a women's intergenerational friendship tea. It will be in two weeks on uh, Saturday, April the 20th from 9 to 1. We have also asked Dana Blau, who is a licensed professional counselor, to come and speak with us on uh, health um, and well-being, emotional health and well-being. The cost is $20, and you can find the registration form on the website if you go to the church calendar and look for events. There's a link there. And so you can fill that out for us. We'll help us know who's coming and, and what your needs are. Child care is provided uh, for children three and under. We do ask that you bring food for them because we don't know what they're going to like and so if you could provide that. Um, <clears throat> just a reminder, if you have already signed up, if you haven't paid, check with Lois Blau Miller about that. So if you're interested in joining, this is for women of all ages. We hope you can come. We'll have some drinks some tea and have some really good food. We have some good things planned for that and have some good input from Dana. If you have any questions, you can talk to me. Lois Blau Miller, Regina Schultz, or Claire de Brun, and we hope you can join us. Good morning, family. In the book of Ephesians, uh, these early Christians say, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We are reminded that our relationship with God in light of the death and resurrection of Jesus is fully revealed as being solely by God's grace, his hold on us. And then we are told, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Out of that place of grace, we have a work to do. And so I want us to notice this morning what the very next work was of these Christians in this early city of Ephesus. It says, therefore, 
Remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcision, back then they called each other names if they thought the other person was out. Can you even imagine what that would be like? Fortunately, that doesn't happen anymore today. Verse 14, for he himself is our peace, Jesus is, who made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them by God through the cross. The word for, uh, the word for Gentile, when you talk about uncircumcised, is the word ethne, where we get the word ethnic. There were different ethnicities that weren't getting along. Can you even imagine what that would be like? To live in a country where there were different ethnicities that were at each other in multiple ways. This was one of the first works of the people of God thousands of years ago. In light of the gospel of Jesus Christ, people thought they had to work at bringing different ethnicities together. In July of 2020, Pastor Craig formed a group that we later named the Intercultural Truth and Transformation Team. Part of the work of this team is to name the racism that has been alive in our own country. And since we are a church in the midst of that culture, in the midst of that country, how did our church work at that? How did it impact us as the people of God? And so our goal was to tell the truth about our church's role in the conversation around race and racism over the years, and then seek to take steps toward healing and transformation in the 21st century world that we live in now. So this morning, one of the works that we've been at is uh, providing a space in our library with some different resources. Uh, there's a number of helpful resources for you to per, uh, peruse, a number of uh, books that have been curated by our team, a number of films, if, if that's the way that you like to go. We even have audio. Uh, we, have an, we have audio of the letter to Birmingham jail from Martin Luther King Jr. And we've attached to that the letter that the pastors of that community wrote to him that precipitated the letter, which is fascinating. Uh, that's also in our library. We have a binder that's, that contains well-researched history of our church's engagement with race and racism over the years. What was our church's role? How did we work at things as we look back? A really well-researched piece with lots of um, connections to some other resources. So we invite you as a church to explore these resources, to have this conversation with us not on the level of either political party or left or right, but on the level of how would Jesus invite us into this conversation as the people of God, as we consider ourselves a part of the kingdom of God. You're going to find it beneficial if you decide to come to it as a learner and not a knower. I invite you to come as a learner and not a knower. It's hard to hear the truth sometimes, but in the hands of Jesus, it always leads to our transformation. And that's our goal. So may we be transformed and agents of transformation in our neighborhoods and world because of the gospel of Jesus the Christ. This morning, as we enter into our next song, we are going to take our monthly Thanksgiving offering. This goes into our compassion fund that helps those in our uh, church community who have specific needs and also is used to support agencies that uh, meet the needs of others in our community. As you bring your Thanksgiving offering, we invite you to remember a gratitude that you have to God. Make your offering be a response out of that gratitude. Let's stand if you're able um, and turn to number 754. In my life, Lord, be glorified.
hymn number 162, The Love of God. 162. Will you pray with me? Holy God, creator, redeemer, we are gathered here today to worship you, the bright morning star, and to offer praise and thanksgiving for the blessings you so freely give and we take so for granted. We acknowledge you as the creator of all, the earthquake, the eclipse, an eternity and a universe we cannot begin to grasp. Everything was made by you. We have once again celebrated Easter. We confess that we cannot begin to know the pain or the power or the promise of the cross. You died a death you did not deserve so that we do not die a death we do deserve. We are humbled when we consider the strength of your love that you would make such a sacrifice for us. Lord, our world is broken. Our churches are shrinking. Our faith is wavering. We are seduced by the cult of our culture. Renew us, Father. Help us recognize that our primary identity is not our sexuality. It is our spirituality. 
It is not our body. It is our soul that is our essence. We confess our self-absorption and our lack of sensitivity to those who do not have the abundance we take for granted. Open our eyes and our hearts to our neighbors here and in the community and around the world who are hungry, who are homeless, who struggle with addictions, who live in fear. We pray, Lord, that you would help us see people as you see people, and that our response would not be to the behavior, but to the need. Help us recognize the shifting terrain between righteousness and what is right, the difference between revenge and justice. Save us from self-righteous arrogance. Forgive us when we don't go far enough. We thank you, Lord, for our church staff, for their leadership, their dedication, and their integrity. Help us as a body of believers grow together, supporting and encouraging one another and strengthening our witness. Now prepare our hearts for the message that has been prepared for us. It is in your most holy name that we pray. Amen. As a child, I memorized the Beatitudes as part of a list of scripture that we were given to memorize in order that I could get my very first Bible. And uh, I no longer have that Bible that was worn out and uh, pages fell, fell out of it years ago, but that scripture that I memorized is still there. And so if you've not memorized the, uh, the Beatitudes, here's your opportunity. One Beatitude at a time as we go through them. Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Please turn to number 290. Blessed are you.
invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. We are going to be there this morning and throughout our series. Have you ever felt cursed? Have you ever felt cursed? In the spring of 2010, Julie, my wife, her, her mother was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. She died a year and a half later, spring of 2010. Spring of 19, our own immediate family was given a cancer diagnosis, and though treatable, was painfully so. As soon as that treatment was over, two weeks after that treatment was over, I don't know about you, but in the spring of 2020, there was a pandemic in our neighborhood. And as that pandemic was running down in the spring of 2022, my own mother was diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor. Spring in the Lee household has been quite a ride for the last 14, 15 years. Now, I can hear some of you saying, well, that's interesting, Jake. Let me tell you my story. And I know some of your stories. If we were to listen to our refugee neighbors, they would tell us stories about having to leave the possessions that they had acquired in their life behind, their country and their community behind because of political violence. They could tell us let me tell you my story. And so in all of these cases, I would like to say all valid. <laughs> and my point exactly, I share part of my story as a way of saying, me too, me too. As a way of saying us too, us too. Sometimes it can feel like we are cursed like we've done something wrong, like we made some kind of mistake and we're being punished for it. Cursed by God for it. In the ancient world, those who were ill or poor or powerless or depressed, they were considered the cursed. They were the ones that were considered shunned by God or by the gods. Those who were considered blessed were those with wealth, health, power, and victory. Does that sound familiar to you? Those who looked the best were considered to be the best, the ones that were divinely blessed. I would argue that not much has changed. If we were to look on the cover of our publications, next slide, we would find wealth. Next slide, or health. Next slide, or power. Next slide, or victory. In fact, on many of our covers, we have to doctor the images so that they look blessed enough because who they really are actually isn't considered blessed enough anymore. And so we have to come up with a kind of fiction. Remember, this is nothing new. In the time of Jesus, we hear people coming to these very same conclusions about the blessed in the Gospel of John. Next slide. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Notice that they don't say, did he sin? Or they say, who did? They immediately attach the fact that he is blind to some person that may have sinned to cause it. There was no question in the disciples' minds that this blindness was a product of God's displeasure, his curse. But Jesus doesn't attach the blindness to anyone's sin or any divine curse. Notice Jesus' response. Next slide. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. He doesn't attach it to anybody's choice. Rather, he attaches the blindness to fertile ground for God's blessing. When Jesus begins his famous Sermon on the Mount, he begins with blessing. When he teaches the people, he begins with blessing. Notice Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him. He began to teach all of them, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, 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 blessed. All before we get to anything in the Sermon on the Mount that talks about who we should be or what we should be doing. Before we get to any of that, we are told that we are blessed. Uh, around these parts, we call that good news. Can I get an amen from the congregation? <laughs> Throughout history, there have been those that want to hear in these blessings that we can earn them. That Jesus begins with, let me tell you how you can earn your blessing. People have always wanted to do this. In fact, some translations try to force it into the text. Next slide. How blessed are those that know they are poor. Do you see where the blessing comes from there? Oh, they know, they know how spiritually poor they are. That's why they get blessed. Or again, in uh, Berkeley's, blessed are they that know their spiritual poverty. I mean, that sounds nice, except that that's not how the Greek is written. Uh, one of my favorite biblical scholars, Dallas Willard, says this of the Beatitudes. If the Greek language wishes to say something about knowing or realizing one has no spiritual goods, it certainly has adequate resources to do so. But it says nothing of that. Jesus did not say, blessed are the poor in spirit, because they are the poor in spirit. It's not how it works. It has been hard for even the people of God to believe that blessing comes to us regardless of our goodness. To the point that when they would see somebody who was blind, they would say, who sinned? How did they get this curse? If we're not careful in passages like this one, we can exchange salvation by works, which Ephesians 2, which I read earlier this morning, speaks against, for salvation by attitude. Well, as long as my attitude is right, then maybe I'll get God's blessing. As if God wants us to be poor in spirit. But that's not how the text works. In the New Testament Greek, there are two words for blessed. I knew Alan was wondering what those words for blessed were. So the first word for blessed, next slide, is eulageo. Everybody say eulageo. That's where we uh, get the word eulogy. Eulageo. It's a blessing that's requested. Uh, maybe you've prayed, God bless my job interview. If you ever prayed anything like that. That's eulageo. It's asking for, it's requesting a blessing that you don't have yet. The other word for blessing in the Greek is makarios. Everybody say makarios. Which is blessing that is already present. You might pray, God, thank you for my blessing. That's makarios. Already have it. Already here. Jesus has, or the New, New Testament interpreters of Jesus have two words to choose. Which will they choose? Yulegeo or makarios? They choose Makarios. Already blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is already the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God as the Gospel of Luke explains it. Already. The words Jesus uses in the Beatitudes is you already have God's blessing. Even when it doesn't feel like it. Notice that what Jesus is saying here is the blessing of God's kingdom has already come to the poor in spirit. It's already theirs. This isn't about how you get blessed. This is an assurance of already having God's blessing, whether it feels like it or looks like it or not. In Luke's gospel, in spirit is omitted so that it reads like this. Next slide. Blessed are you, and we'll do this the last week. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Well, which is it, Matthew and Luke? Would you guys make up your mind, please? This is scripture, after all. It has to agree. Is it poor in spirit or is it poor? Which is it? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. There wasn't a separation from hunger and spiritual hunger in the ancient world, from financial need and spiritual need. They were all tied together. For the ancients, everything was spiritual. All of it. There was no secular world and state. No, it was all spiritual. Poor in spirit here refers to all that experience poverty of health, of wealth, of love, of faith. And in every age, poverty has been considered a failure in every way, right? Poverty is seen as failure, as culpability, including spiritual poverty in our day. 
so that Matthew's version of Jesus' teaching could rightly sound this way, blessed are the spiritually bankrupt, the doubters, the Bible avoiders, the Sunday skippers, the prayer neglectors, they are blessed. They are blessed. Notice what Jesus is doing here. The kingdom of heaven of God comes to those who think it's the farthest away from them. It comes even to them. Perhaps if you're taking notes, you could say this, blessed are the cursed. Blessed are the cursed. Which doesn't mean the spiritually rich aren't blessed. It just means that Jesus is expanding our understanding of who gets and lives in God's blessing, who it's for. In the kingdom of God, everybody gets blessed, even the spiritually lacking. And this blessing comes solely because Jesus chooses to be present even to the poorest in spirit. Do you ever feel poor in spirit? Uh, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Do you ever feel just poor? The presence of Christ is with you. Today we begin our series, The Disparity Gospel. It's both a nod to those of us who feel we are less blessed, less deserving, less spiritual than the next person, and also a pushback against the toxin that has been the prosperity gospel, which is really not good news at all, to be honest with you. The idea that health and wealth and security are the divine right and sign of those who belong to God. What would it be like to live in a church that believes that health and wealth was the sign that you belong to God? What would you have to do to be a part of that church? You'd have to dress a certain way, right? Like you'd have to look nice to show people that you, you know, that you were blessed by God, that you were actually one of the ones that was in. You'd have to communicate to others by how you dress that you actually belong to God. You would have to act like everything was fine every Sunday. What would that be like? Wouldn't that be terrible? What if on Sunday you had to come and pretend like everything was fine when everything wasn't, when you had just gotten a diagnosis for the fourth spring in a row? In a gospel that says that it's the wealth and health, those that have it that are the blessed that are in, that's what you have to do. You have to pretend like things are in ways that they aren't. The disparity gospel sees evidence of God's blessing in the presence of Christ and in the presence of Christ alone. If the prosperity gospel is about those who have, the disparity gospel is about those who have Jesus. Period. Period. Which allows us the authenticity to share how we really are. We don't have to put on airs. We can be who we are. Which allows us to be honest about what we really need. What if we lived in a church community where we could be honest about our needs and about how we really were, where we could be ourselves? That's what we're being invited into. Jesus teaches us that his blessing of the kingdom is ours even when our credit card is maxed, our theology is weak, our health is failing, or our hearts are breaking. God's blessing is even for the poor in spirit. Can I get an amen from the congregation? Which, the news gets better, you ready? Pearl, you ready? The news gets better. So great. I've been waiting for this all week. Here we go. It's more than just about what we receive from God. To understand a word more fully in the scriptures, you have to do what the Jews called the principle of first usage. If they saw a word somewhere, they said, oh, where was the first time that word was used in scripture? And they would allow that to define that word throughout scripture. What is the first time we see the word bless and blessing in the scriptures? I thought, you, Dex, I thought you'd never ask. Thank you. Comes from Genesis chapter 12. God calls his people through the person of Abraham. He says, you are going to be my people. Not because you're so great, Abraham, although some wanted to make it about how great Abraham was. The text says nothing of that. But because of how great God is, how full of grace and mercy God is. And so this is what it sounds like. Yahweh, God, had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, 
and I will bless you. I will make your name great. Thanks, God. Thanks for blessing me and making my name great. It's just what I wanted. Thanks. He promises to bless Abraham out of God's grace, not out of Abraham's faithfulness. All Abraham is invited to do is trust that God's blessing will be on his life in plenty and in want, in richness and in poverty. The word for bless here is the word barak. Everybody say barak. Bless. Bless. But it's not enough to understand blessing on this level in the Hebrew scriptures because this is the very next part of Genesis chapter 12. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing to all nations. The word for blessing, Val, I knew you were wondering. The word, the word for blessing uh, is baraka. Everybody say baraka. Blessing can't be understood as just Barak. It's Barak and Baraka. I am blessed so that I also can be a blessing. Blessing as it comes from God is never just about only what we receive. It's also about what we can give. It's not just about what we get from God, but it's also that we are given meaning. Not just Barak, but Baraka. In the scriptures, the language of God's blessing is not just about his presence with us, but his calling upon us, upon you, upon you, his calling upon you. The very first blessing from God includes giving our lives meaning. That's stinking good news. You can quote that. You can write that down if you want. That's stinking good news. So in my mother's kindergarten class, I was in her kindergarten class. Yes, my mom needed prayer. One of our favorite things in my mom's kindergarten class, Leo, this is fantastic, was overalls. I loved the overalls. They hung on the wall and there's lots of pockets in the overalls. And then there was popsicle sticks that went in the, can you see this? There's popsicle sticks that go in the overalls. Just picture it, I know it's hard Wayne, but just picture it. And each popsicle stick was our name and each pocket was a job. We all wanted to be line leader. Like that's the thing we wanted to be, right? We couldn't wait, are we gonna be line leader? Then there was the calendar changer, you change the calendar, and then you were the, there was the weather person, you got to like say what the weather was. Ron was also in my mom's class, apparently he knows about this. And you had all these jobs, and we could not wait as kids to get there on Monday morning and find out what our job was. What do we get to do? How do we get to participate with this class and with our friends and those that we don't like very much too? How do we get to matter? Things do not change when we leave kindergarten, do they? We want to be reminded that we matter. That we matter. Illness can strip us of feeling like we matter. Financial poverty can steal from us this idea that we have anything to give. Maybe that's the greatest curse of illness or poverty or lack of opportunity or anxiety or doubt. That suddenly we are stripped of a feeling that we matter anymore. Jesus says, you ready? Mickey, you ready? Jesus says we matter. We matter. No matter our age or our health or what we have or what we don't have. Jesus says yours is the kingdom of God. Consider yourself extravagantly blessed to receive the presence of the resurrected Christ in your poverty, spiritual or otherwise. To give and serve alongside the resurrected Christ out of your poverty, spiritual or otherwise. Because the blessing of Christ is already yours through no effort of your own. Do you feel like you have little to your name? Jesus says you matter. Do you find yourself doubting the tenets of the faith sometimes? Jesus beckons you to serve anyway. Do you struggle to feel or look like what you think a Christian should look or feel like? Jesus says, you don't have to fake it into my kingdom anymore. Listen to the voice of the resurrected Christ 
who calls you already blessed, who says that you already matter. That is the good news at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. God, we open up ourselves to you, remembering that you already have poured out your makarios, barak and baraka, on us. Help us to trust that we are already blessed because of the grace that is demonstrated in the death and resurrection of Jesus. Help us to trust that the ancient calling on Abram and the people of God to be a blessing is a calling that you have also given to us. We choose to follow you where you lead. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Thank you so much for that, Jake. Um, and thinking on that blessing and God's love and mercy for us. Let's sing number 156. There's a wideness in God's mercy. 156. Number 712, 712.
How do we move from being blessed to being a blessing? There are so many ways, and one of the ways that we can do that is by sharing our tithes and our offerings because these are used in order that others might be blessed by experiencing and being brought into and living in the kingdom of heaven. Please join me in our offering litany. Lord, we bring before you the common things of our common life, our money, our songs, our labors to be your faithful congregation, our needs and dreams, our joys and sorrows, our time and talents. We celebrate all this with you, seeking the touch of your spirit so that we will share more deeply what we are and have with all our brothers and sisters in our city and our world. In faith and gratitude, we offer common things made miracles by the blessing of your grace. Amen. If you came prepared to give this morning, you may leave your offering in the boxes as you leave. Hi, Jim. Thank you for blessing this morning. Thank you so much for joining us in worship on this second Sunday of Easter. May you, especially in the areas of your life where you're beginning to feel cursed, in case that's not just me, may you pay attention and have eyes to see the ways that God is already blessing you, pouring out his blessing and his favor on you. And in the places around you, a places that fe especially the places that feel cursed, May you remember that you matter in those places, that you matter among those people, that God has given you a blessing to give. The grace and peace for Lord Jesus the Christ be with all of you today. Thank you. Our last song, number 827, Move in Our Midst. 